Good afternoon. My name is Damaris Colonel from the Mission of Switzerland to the WTO. On behalf of the Graduate Institute's Global Governance Center, the Forum on Trade, Environment and the SDGs, TESS, UNCTAD, the UNEP Environment and Trade Hub, the Geneva Environment Network, and the Geneva Trade Platform, I would like to very warmly welcome to this online launch and roundtable on how can trade policy help tackle plastic pollution. As you know, we'll start with a presentation of a brand new report on this topic, co-authored by Dr. Carolyn Der Burbeck and Mahesh Sugathan, which, which aim is really to facilitate and support discussion of policy options among governments and uh, that with also a diversity of relevant stakeholders and to discuss more on how trade is relevant to the challenges of plastic pollution and what is it we can do concretely. I have to say that I had the chance to have a sneak preview of the report, of the report which will be published online next week. And I can already confirm to you that it will be a fantastic and very valuable resource, uh, notably in the context of the next WTO Ministerial Conference, but also beyond. Um, after the, the presentation, we'll turn to a roundtable discussion that will be moderated by David Vivas from UNCTAD. And as we have such a full roundtable with fantastic speakers, we have opted to conduct the discussion via the chat feature. So please feel free to uh, uh, put in your questions or comments through the chat feature, and uh, we'll try to engage as proactively as we can. So we really encourage you to pose your question directly on the chat to speakers and discussants, and also feel free if you have some to share resources um, that you feel would be relevant for the discussion. Before introducing our speakers, I just wanted to say two, uh, a few words on, on this report and why uh, we firmly believe that this is such a, a, a timely uh, initiative. First, I think it's clear to, uh, uh, to all of us that the world is facing a plastic uh, crisis. We have a number of initiatives being taken at the national, regional and international level. For example, we have now over 100 countries around the world calling for a global treaty on plastic pollution. And it's clear that we need to ramp up international cooperation to tackle this urgent global environmental challenge. But to do so and to be able to devise concrete measures, we also need to understand more the trade dimensions of the plastic pollution and how international cooperation on trade and trade policies can really complement, support, and be integrated into such international efforts to reduce plastic pollution. And second, it is also very timely because as many of you know, now plastic pollution is on the agenda of the WTO. Indeed, we had seen a key development in November of last year by the launch of a process called the Informal Dialogue on Plastic Pollution and Environmentally Sustainable Plastics Trade, um, sustainable plastic trade. And um, uh, it is even more timely that, uh, as you know, the ministerial conference of the WTO is fast approaching and the uh, so-called IDP is now currently working on a ministerial statement. And uh, um, I very much hope that uh, the, the policy options and the elements contained of the report will inspire our work. Um, I just want to say that this process uh, of the IDP complements also another process that was also launched in, in November called the Structured Discussion on Trade and Environmental Sustainability, which uh, also aims to um, uh, have action-oriented dialogue among WTO members on way to advance more sustainable trade into a range of issues, including climate, circular economy, and green aid for trade. And many uh, elements of the report will certainly also inform our work um, in this regard. So it is clear that we have now not only momentum, but also in interest among a wide, a a wide uh, a variety of WTO members in trying to find concrete ways to um, achieve and uh, support the greening of international trade. One thing that as government we have seen in the last uh, discussion, not only in the IDP, but mainly in the structured discussion on trade and environmental sustainability, that the challenge uh, uh, facing us are so multifaceted, involving so much stakeholders and different perspectives that government need help in order to see what are the measures that can be devised, what are the uh, options we have to devise policy options, and uh, also in order to create synergies and avoid duplication. And I am firmly convinced that this report will help uh, by building the evidence we need to have such informed discussion. 
But uh, I've said enough, and I will now turn to the uh, report co-authors for um, a presentation that should last around 20 minutes. And um, I don't think Carolyn, uh, Dr. Carolyn Dear Burbeck needs an introduction, but for the ones that don't have the chance to know her, uh, to know her, let me briefly say a few words. She's the director of the Forum on Trade, Environment and SDGs uh, that we all know now as PES, uh, which is a partnership of, of UNEP and the Graduate Institute housed at the GDP. Um, TESS is already no doubt an important actor in Geneva and will support, and this is a testimony of how it's already supporting our discussions on policy options on trade and sustainability. She's also a senior researcher at the Global Governance Center where she leads a research project on transforming the global plastics economy supported by the Swiss Network of International Studies. And together with her is Mahesh Sugethan, who is a senior policy advisor at TESS and also an independent trade and sustainability expert who has consulted for a range of international organizations. So now over to you, Carolyn and Mahesh. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much to Maris for the invitation and good afternoon, everyone. And a special thanks also to those who are joining us um, on the round table. I am just going to uh, share my screen and then we will get started with our presentation. Oopsie. Voila. Great. So uh, thank you all again for your interest in how trade policy can help tackle plastic pollution. Um, just to follow what Damaris has said, I would like to thank um, the Swiss Network for International Studies who've supported um, an ongoing project that we have on transforming the global plastics economy um, at the Graduate Institute in partnership with UNCTAD. And specifically for this study, we received the support of the Pew Charitable Trusts. Um, so I'd like to thank them as well. So in our presentation, we wanna briefly walk you through some of the key findings and examples from our port, report, as well as some of the key policy options and pathways forward that we identified. I should note from the outset that our report was really a scoping exercise. It, it aimed to map and draw together a lot of existing work and also add to it. But some of you here will see your own work reflected um, in this study. We really wanted to, to, to provide a broad state of play. We mapped the trade trends, the current state of play on trade policies and measures relevant to plastic and plastic pollution. And we also run through um, some of the key uh, policies that governments are already introducing and the existing governance frameworks. But the real contribution of the report is on the policy options and potential pathways forward. So I should emphasize that this report also is a team effort. We had several commissioned inputs into this study. Some of the people who um, wrote some of those are on the round table today, but we will also envisage a set of follow-up um, uh, sessions like this on some of the specific areas that we zoomed into. So you can look forward to that um, later. Uh, so today, as we have an audience that includes both stakeholders and experts from the trade arena and also from the environment arena, I thought it would be good just to take a few minutes at the beginning to remind us of some of the environmental background uh, to this issue and our presentation today. Oops. So uh, the first, of course, is that we're here this afternoon because our planet is overwhelmed by too much plastic, right? And by too much plastic pollution across the life cycle of plastics. Challenges are already receiving extraordinary media and public attention. It resonates with almost all of us in our daily lives. And there are a number of campaigns around the world to deal with this. Now, uh, the corporate sector also um, is increasingly concerned about the issue of plastic pollution. It realizes it's relevant to finding that it needs to be part of the solution to this problem. And here is just a few examples of some of the initiatives that are underway trying to work in partnership with the business sector. But there's also recognition that all of this to date is not enough. And as Damaris has mentioned, there are calls for a new international treaty on plastic pollution. And here's a couple of the studies um, that are out there. And I'm sure some of our colleagues will talk more about this in the, in the round table. But there is also at the UN, a group of friends made of governments um, specifically committed to combating marine plastic pollution. So we're also here today because plastic is extremely useful. Um, it can serve so many purposes. Um, the clearest proof of that um, is how much plastic production and use has grown over the past 30 years. It's grown massively and it's expected to continue to grow fourfold by 2050, as you'll see in this, in this um, diagram here. Now at a more granular level, there are many different types of plastics and they all have different kinds of environmental impacts. We don't have time to go into that today. 
But a key point to note also is that, that while the per, the per capita consumption of plastics in developed countries is much, much higher than consumption in developing countries, it is the latter, it's developing countries where the demand for plastics is growing most quickly, which makes sense because the population is growing there and they're also having economic growth. So this is really a global issue in terms of where we have to tackle um, the consumption side as well. But a key point we want to make in our paper is that plastic production is also a supply story. The huge expansion of plastics has been driven by low cost of fossil fuel feedstocks to make what are known as virgin primary plastics. And critically, we also provide a first set of evidence in this paper on the ways in which the plastic sector, and in particular, the petrochemical sector, is subsidized, um, along with well-known subsidies to fossil fuels themselves. So in the paper, we provide some preliminary estimates of those subsidies, and several colleagues are looking into this further. Um, critically, it's also important to know that for the oil and gas sector, the petrochemical sector is seen as a key growth sector in the future. And so there's massive investment ongoing um, in expanding plastic production around the world at the same time as we talk about reducing plastic pollution. Um, now, just a quick note here as we have more of this in the report is that the, the largest share of plastic use by end use is for packaging. You can see that in the blue on this diagram. It's over 35% of the use of a plastic produced each year or in 2019. Now the last point just on context before we move on to the trade side is that there's an evolving understanding of what the plastic pollution uh, looks problem looks like. Now we're all aware of the problems with downstream plastic pollution in oceans, particularly marine litter and microplastics. Um, but there's also massive problem of um, plastic pollution in rivers and on land, in sewage systems, agricultural fields and roads. And this is a particular problem in developing countries. In recent years, we've also seen more analysis of plastic pollution challenges along the life cycle of plastics from production through to disposal. These cause enormous economic and fiscal costs, especially in countries that are faced with cleaning up and managing different kinds of pollution. There are health impacts and there's also an enormous and growing carbon footprint of the plastic sector. Um, and if we look to the right, what we're looking at increasingly is a focus on not just looking at the downstream, but also the upstream sides of the plastics um, pollution challenge. And so there are more and more efforts to look at reducing unnecessary use, reducing production of certain products and virgin plastic inputs, improving plastic design and production, and also trying to improve recycling markets. And all of this comes under the wider rubric of a more circular um, plastics economy. So having set the scene, I bet you're all asking, what does this all have to do with trade? So, um, oh, just before I get to that, the, the key thing I think when I look at this, uh, this, um, this slide here on the whole plastics pollution um, challenge is that tackling this will require a systems change uh, approach. And if you haven't seen it, I would recommend to you a study by Pew last year, where they emphasized that reducing just ocean plastic pollution by 2040 would require a systems approach. It's not just one thing is gonna make the difference. It will require a reduction in plastic production, substituting plastic with other materials, improved design of products and packaging, increased waste collection rates and recycling, building facilities for recycling, and also reducing plastic waste exports. So the point here is there's no silver bullet. We'll need many different approaches in tandem. And so now I'll get back to the trade angle. So the point here is that behind plastic pollution is a global plastics economy. Uh, plastic production is distributed around the world as is consumption and also as is waste disposal. And so um, whilst China, North America and Europe are responsible for the greater share of production, of plastics, many other countries are involved as well in different parts of the, um, of the life cycle of plastics and in the value chain. So this means that action just at the national level is not enough. We need to understand the global dynamics and the global trends and drivers. And here's where we get specifically to trade. Um, right, so in the International trade plays a central role across the life cycle of plastics. There's trade in fossil fuel feedstocks, in virgin primary plastics, in packaging, in plastic products, and the millions of products um, with, uh, uh, with plastic embedded in them, and in products that are wrapped and transported in plastics. There's um, enormous trade in synthetic textiles, also in waste, and in some secondary waste products. 
So in a study that we conducted um, last year with UNCTAD, and we have been doing a lot of work with them to try and identify um, how, we can, how we can better understand trade trends across um, the plastics life cycle. And so last year we went through um, all of the trade statistics and codes and tried to find a way of better organizing our understanding of um, trade flows in plastics. Um, and so here, uh, and I'm sure my colleague Diana, I'm sure will talk more about this when she speaks later, but here we just try and show you just the scale first of trade across um, the plastics economy. So it's worth over 1 trillion a year, which is 5% of the total value of global trade. And you'll note here that whilst there is a tremendous emphasis placed on trade in plastic waste, which is of course a, a, a key environmental issue, there's huge, much, much greater volumes and value of trade earlier in the plastic life cycle. And here we would note that um, our statistics here do not include um, the millions of additional tons of international trade flows of plastic that are embedded in uh, prepackaged products, um, sorry, they're embedded in other plastic products that are not classified as plastic per se. So this includes a vast number of electronic goods, cars, vehicles, tables, offered equipment, all kinds of things that aren't listed specifically as plastics, but we know they have plastics in them. And also the vast array of prepackaged products that cross borders. So this is an underestimate, this trillion dollars is, is the point that, that we'd like to make here. And in the paper, and I won't go into these in any detail, but we do provide you, this is again building on work with UNCTAD, 2019 data at each um, stage of the, of the life cycle of plastics. And so here's a snapshot of um, trade in primary forms of plastics. And then we also provide this, um, and we, the countries in orange, I've labeled them because that's the, they're all EU countries. Here we've listed them separately, but it gives you a sense of the overall scale of the EU as part of that by putting them in orange. Um, so here we've also, for example, looked at, at plastic, empty plastic packaging exports. And this is interesting because as I noted a minute ago, the empty plastic packaging pack exports do not at all account for the full picture of the amount of packaging that's crossing borders internationally. This is just about the empty packaging that goes backwards and forwards. Um, but here you can see that there are some key players um, in the export of empty plastic packaging. Um, it's worth over $55 uh, billion uh, uh, a year. Um, and in our estimates, we found that the um, working with some colleagues in, in Lausanne, that the uh, hidden trade in plastic packaging is actually more than double the trade in plastic packaging that you see here in this diagram. And then the reason this trade in plastic packaging matters so much is that of course, it's not just the waste that countries import that becomes part of their waste issue to manage. It's also the products and the packaging that they import that is something that their country then has to deal with as part of its waste management system. Um, so then we also provide information about plastic waste um, trade itself, which is here. Um, and all of this again is, is available in more detail in the report. And we've also updated for 2019, we provide an overview of the top 10 countries by each stage of the life cycle who are involved um, both as exporters and importers by volume um, and, by, and by value. Now I'm going to turn um, now to Mahesh, who's going to give you just a little spotlight of some of the work that we did on, um, on, the, on the policy measures. Now for the, the paper itself has a lot broader scope than this, but he's just gonna pick um, two aspects that we looked into to provide some insight on what we've got there. Mahesh, you have the floor. Great. Yes, uh, thank you, Caroline. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so following up on, on Caroline's uh, presentation before, um, I just wanted to focus on some of the trade policy measures that countries have been taking at the domestic level. Uh, increasingly, there have been a, a lot of measures that are relevant to plastics. I mean, for example, countries have put in place import restrictions or bans. 61 countries have adopted manufacturing or import bans. Uh, over the period 2009 to 19, uh, 2018, WTO members notified at least 128 measures for tra affecting trade in plastics for environmental reasons. There have also been a lot of uh, measures that have been adopted for non-environmental reasons as well, including health and safety, product quality, etc. Now, the number of uh, plastic notifications have been growing. Uh, of 128 notifications, 71 that is notified in the last three years, uh, and it continues to rise. Many of these measures are also those that are not being notified to the WTO. 
most of these measures were notified by developing countries, which at least more than half, about 68% and 13% by LDCs. Now in 2021, the WTO also identified uh, which areas along the plastic value chain were these measures being applied. And it seems that almost 80% of notified plastic measures focus on downstream segments. That is on materials like plastic waste and scrap, uh, which uh, comprise about 34 measures, recycling, uh, comprising 33 measures, packaging materials, 30 measures, and finished plastic goods, 85 measures. Of these, only 20% of the notified measures applied to the upstream parts of the plastics value chain, such as primary plastics, uh, which comprise about 75 measures, or plastic-based inputs to other goods, which comprise about 12 measures. So the trend clearly is that uh, these, no, these measures are being taken increasingly and it's, it's set to grow in the future as well. Next slide. So now I'll talk a bit about the, the substitutes uh, on environmentally friendly substitutes. Now, a lot of developing countries have potential for producing substances which are, which are you know, friendlier substitutes to plastics. Now, why do we why do we why do we think this is important? Because one one thing is that these uh, materials respond to the environment and development needs as well as trade interests for developing countries. So, a number of developing countries are producers as well as exporters of natural fibers like cotton, jute, abaca, coir, kenaf, and sisal, as well as manufactured wood-based packaging such as paper and cardboard. Now, these materials could provide not just trade opportunities, but they could also provide livelihood opportunities for people in developing countries, particularly in rural areas. The other important point is that in many developing countries, if not most developing countries, there is a lack of adequate facilities to recycle and to compost plastics and including some of the, the bioplastics such as PLA. So in this context, it seems that some, you know, if you have compostable, fully compostable substitutes, which don't need this additional infrastructure to process it, that could be a, a good fit for, for the conditions that prevail in many developing countries. Plus it also offers these export opportunities and livelihood opportunities. So in one way, promoting substitutes could offer a win-win-win situation for trade environment and development. Secondly, import tariffs could represent a low hanging fruit that could be addressed. I mean, there are tariffs that still persist for natural fibers and particularly in the con context of South-South trade, these tariffs range from zero to more than 30% in some of the major markets. Tariff escalation is also a feature as with many other products. And in many cases, tariffs are much higher than those imposed on polymer feedstocks and plastic products. So we see examples for in many countries where the applied tariffs on some of these natural substitutes and the processed products are actually much higher than those applied on polymer feedstocks and plastic products. So the question would be, well, you know, if we address these tariffs, that opens up a lot more market opportunities for these developing countries to export these products. Thirdly, the evolution of standards is going to shape uh, a lot of future trade opportunities for plastic substitutes. Uh, these, for example, include trust standards, which are adopted pursuant, per, pursuant to initiatives such as the EU Circular Economy Initiative. So a lot of standards are still evolving. I mean, you have international standards that are set by the ISO, but you'd also have national standards, national regulations, as well as private sector standards that are then required by retailers or supermarket chains. In addition, there is a, a whole set of standards that still needs to be developed for you know, uh, bioplastics, for compostable products and so on. So there are a lot of range of, of standards that, that still have to be developed. And in addition to that, there's also definitions which need to be clarified like compostability and biodegradability, which will also, uh, you know, set the sort of criteria by which which products can, can, can fit that criteria or not and, and gain market access or not. Then in addition to multilateral efforts at trade liberalization, uh, regional trade and cooperation initiatives will be critical. So on one hand, you would have uh, initiatives like the environmental goods agreement, you know, for example, where these substitutes could be promoted and tariffs could be reduced. But on the other hand, uh, there is also a lot of regional trade agreements where trade has already been liberalized and which offers a lot of opportunities for further cooperation on, on these substitutes. Uh, technology and innovation is important for realizing scale uh, potential. Uh, 
So what we found is that for many uh, uh, substitutes which are made, for example, from agro waste, developing countries would need better technology uh, to, to, to produce at scale and to produce to the quality standards. Uh, finally, trade-led initiatives should be complemented by broader measures to address a level playing field. I mean, even if you reduce tariffs and NTMs, you also have the issue of uh, price uh, of plastics being still very low, mainly because of the substitutes given to plastic fossil fuel subsidies. So addressing some of these and, and maybe measures at the domestic level like tax incentives and, and other tax measures could also uh, provide a level playing field which uh, in favor of these substitutes compared to plastics. Sorry if I went on a bit longer than expected, Caroline, it's over to you. No, that's perfect, Mahesh, thank you very much. So um, looking forward now, what can we do in terms of international cooperation? So the first thing you've heard a little bit about what's missing, we're missing some key um, data and monitoring on trends in trade flows and in trade related measures and their relevance to um, efforts to reduce plastic pollution. We're missing dialogue and cooperation. National approaches are being developed in an uncoordinated and disjointed manner. We're also lacking transparency. So many of the exporters and also in innovative companies that are trying to reduce their plastic waste um, and the plastic pollution um, are finding it increasingly, uh, are facing an increasingly complex um, regulatory framework. Um, there's also a general problem with policy coherence. So the trade policy frameworks are not well aligned with domestic measures to reduce plastic pollution. And we don't have a lot of attention yet to the particular opportunities and challenges, um, some of those that Mahesh was just talking about that are facing developing countries. So uh, where we look, so where, where is there currently international cooperation on trade? Well, the main area is around um, the ex export restrictions on contaminated and unrecyclable plastic wastes. And these new rules came in last year as part of the Basel Convention Plastic Waste Amendment. I know one of our speakers will touch on those further, so I, I won't talk about them here. The only other trade related instrument we have is um, rules we have is from the Stockholm Convention, where it prohibits or restricts production, use and trade in a certain limited number of persistent organic pollutants. But otherwise, we have no formal international cooperation around the trade aspects um, of plastic that are relevant to plastic pollution. It's kind of wide open. Now, in our study, we um, going very quickly to some of the options that we found. The first were a set around what we called informing, informing, enabling and supporting actions. These are sort of indirect things that could be done. So we can address some of these gaps in, in data on trade flows. Um, we can improve transparency, reporting and notifications of trade related measures and experiences. We can support more analysis and information sharing on how particular trade policy options can be used and could be enhanced. Um, by international cooperation, and also importantly, where and how trade rules and policies can impede or undermine plastic pollution reduction efforts. And we can also um, boost trade related um, technical assistance and capacity building um, for developing countries to assist their efforts in reducing plastic pollution, and in particular on the trade dimensions. But we can also be a bit more ambitious and look at ways to incubate, incubate and catalyze um, action with more direct impacts. So one is to promote trade in goods and services for appropriate environmentally sound waste, waste management technologies. We can explore opportunities to promote trade in substitutes as Mahesh has been talking. Also in goods and services that promote reuse and refill systems and in products that, that may be certified for instance as plastic free and also in recycled plastic products. We could support um, bans, restrictions, and phase outs of trade in certain problematic plastics. And that includes those that, um, that are um, certain single use plastics and also plastics that contain um, hazardous or toxic um, additives or that are associated with microplastic pollution. We can also support the development and implementation of international standards and classifications that are necessary to facilitate the efforts of governments to promote more environmentally sustainable plastics trade. This includes international standards, but also updated systems for classifying trade so that we can better capture what kind of um, plastics are flowing across borders. And we can also increase the transparency of subsidies um, to the plastic sector. Now, there are many different pathways to which we can do this. One is through the international environmental processes. Already we have MEA such as the Basel Convention working on some aspects of plastic pollution, um, there are also, uh, of trade uh, aspects of plastic pollution. And there may also be ways of integrating specific um, topics around trade or targets or around sustainable, sustainability standards for trade into the global plastic pollution treaty process. 
There is, as Damaris mentioned earlier, the WTO informal dialogue on plastic pollution. And there's also work that can be undertaken in the WTO's regular committees, which I won't go into here. Um, but there's also important action that we can take um, in other international economic organizations. UNCTAD, as I mentioned before, is taking the lead on trying to help us better understand flows um, in um, trade flows in plastics. Um, and also uh, in the, the scope for a trade in plastic substitutes. And there's work that can be done at the ISO around international standards and the WCO around up, up amending um, HS classifications for plastics. Um, there are also efforts that can be taken at the regional level to help countries work together around some of their um, trade related plastic policies. So we have a less uncoordinated and piecemeal approach among different countries, see if they could find more regional approaches. And of course, we need to enhance cooperation across them. Now I'm conscious, Damaris, that we're running um, over what we said we were gonna take. So I'm just gonna take one minute to wrap up. So Damaris has already mentioned the informal dialogue on plastic pollution. I can put up the slide later um, if people want to know more about that. But I did just wanna specifically end on some specific things that I think that could be done at the WTO. Um, and the first thing here is that um, countries could ensure that single use and other environmentally harmful plastics that they limit or ban domestically are not exported to other countries. So that's a matter of policy coherence. They could agree to lower tariffs and other trade barriers to substitutes um, and facilitate um, trade in waste management technologies and in recyclable plastics. They could um, make concrete pledges to reduce unnecessary and excessive plastic packaging associated with trade and to find ways to better coordinate their policies and requirements for sustainable packaging. Um, and of course they could work, as I mentioned before, to, to call on the ISO and other bodies to help them develop, um, to, to, to support the development of international standards that are relevant. They could build um, a stronger aid for trade support system for developing countries in this area. They could call for uh, um, in more disaggregated classifications of trade they could call for better monitoring of um, uh, um, existing measures on plastics trade. And also they could continue this process of exchange and dialogue on the range of intersections between trade and plastics pollution. So just to wrap up, our key message is that the trade plays a central role in the global plastics economy and in plastic pollution. We need more international cooperation in this space to ensure that trade policies don't stand in the way to harness them where we can to help drive transformation and adjust transition in the plastic sector, to support implementation of existing rules, um, such as those in the Basel Convention, to promote transparent approaches um, that work for business, to promote coherence, address development needs, and most of all, to support and complement existing national efforts and international efforts to reduce plastic pollution. So thank you so much, Damaris. Thank you so much, uh, Carolyn and, and Maj, for this uh, outstanding presentation. Uh, uh, lots of food for thought and uh, especially a, a number of very concrete options. We now have about 45 minutes for the roundtable discussion. And it is now my pleasure to turn to uh, David Vivas to moderate that discussion. As you probably all know, David uh, is a legal officer in uh, the Trade, Environment, Climate Change and Sustainable Development branch of UNCTAD. And without further ado, uh, uh, also cognizant of time, I will uh, pass him the floor. David, over to you. Thank you very much, Damari. Thank you very much, Carolina Mahesh, for this uh, uh, very impressive presentation. We have today a wonderful list of commenting. I will ask the commentators to, to uh, limit their comments to four minutes each, because we have a little time. Uh, I will start um, uh, in this segment of commentary, giving the floor to Jovan, who works at the WTO. Uh, Jovan Benjadur uh, is a dear friend. I know him from the Oceans Debate in New York. Uh, Jovan, I think there have been very, very specific suggestions for WTO action. So from the point of view, what, will, what uh, governments in the WTO can do in terms of uh, debate, in terms of rulemaking and in terms of aid for trade, uh, based on the recommendations presented today. You have the floor, Jovan. Thank you very much, uh, David. And let me first uh, congratulate Caroline and Mahesh and all the organizers, uh, Switzerland and others, for putting together such a wonderful uh, discussion uh, today. Uh, it's really great. I mean, I think uh, Caroline did a, and, and Mahesh did a stellar piece of work with, with colleagues. I think 
clearly you've shown, you've demonstrated where the, the issues are in terms of data, in terms of what we're missing on, on, on data, information. There's a, clearly a lacuna here on, on where we are in terms of the plastics problem. Uh, even, even the data we have is probably not accurate. I mean, we, when we look at some of these um, issues uh, and the implications of the impacts, uh, clearly that's always work in progress. And sometimes you see how, how massive the problem is. But I think moving from the, from the research, the data, the, the great ideas that are coming up in this report, uh, and thank you also, uh, Caroline, for, for reaching out to the WTO for, for some consultations leading to the finalization of this report. I think it's important that at the end of the day, it gets back to, to the development agenda. It has, to come, it has to come down at some point to programmatic work, to the development agenda, to the SDGs, to, to how, how are countries going to be able to better equip themselves to tackle the plastics problem? Um, and, 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 you know, data is important. Research and ideas are great. But I think the, the central question is how do we get countries to, to do this? How do we ensure that there's an equal playing field so that countries can also, in a predictable way, as well as companies, know what to do? And, and finding that sweet spot is always extremely difficult. And we've seen it at different institutions, different fora, international organizations. On the fisheries, for example, we are, we are hopefully coming to term with a, with a negotiation at some point so that we can get an agreement on the ending of harmful fishery subsidies. But that has taken 20 years. And at some point, we've got we to gotta tell ourselves how long is that going to take? Same for plastics. There's great discussions since the last few years through the uh, informal um, uh, groups, but also the structured discussions. And, and we've been able to share knowledge, countries have been able to share knowledge, share research, share experience of what's working, what's not working, and what kind of capacity they might need in the future. So I think on that sense, the WTO is, 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 a, is, a, is a great platform for transparency, for notification, for um, strengthening, strengthening policy coherence, uh, identifying the types of scopes that are needed for, for collective approaches, uh, improving transparency, I think that's going to be essential because it is a global phenomenon. It is a global problem. And global problems absolutely need global solutions. And I think that the WTO and, and, and you know, we, we are one of the organizations that I think are well placed to at least uh, start some of those conversations, have those dialogues, uh, share the, the country capacity needs. And of course, monitor trade and trends and progress this, together with UNCTAD and, and UNEP and, and other organizations. So all in all to say that, um, uh, you know, we are at a critical moment of our uh, international trade agenda. The multilateral trading system is at a key moment in its, in its, uh, in its history, in its life. Um, MC12, the ministerial conference is coming up at the end of the year where there are other related topics, very, very closely related to the plastics agenda, such as climate change, where plastics is gonna impact climate and climate is also gonna impact uh, the plastics agenda which we are also trying to bridge with, with a trade agenda. So all in all to say, Caroline, uh, Mahesh and other colleagues, that this work is going to only continue, it's only going to increase, it's only going to, going to become more important for the work at the WTO and, and the trade agenda. The WTO uh, colleague secretariat, Ho Holim, for example, is, is a great colleague uh, who many of you know, uh, director for trade and environment, uh, and our team, I think, stand very much ready to continue supporting member states as needed uh, on this work and, and, and really bring that to the attention of countries. Um, it's everybody's business, David. At the end of the day, the plastics, the oceans, is everybody's business, not just countries, of course. And that's where we look forward to work very closely with, with a number of uh, stakeholders on that agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's good to see that we are in business and I'm very happy you mentioned that we should be, be, be bringing back development into the agenda. We have a new agenda, which are sustainable development goals. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good direction. Also a point that you made on notifications, the number of notifications have not increased a lot in the last two years, perhaps due to COVID, but our estimates is that, uh, that WTO members are notifying only about one third of the actual notifications in place. So big effort to improve transparency in notification to have better understanding on the regulatory trends. And data, happy to cooperate with WTO and other partners. Now we go to to Maria Daniela Garcia, who is Deputy Permanent Representative of Ecuador to the WTO and other uh, UN organizations in Geneva. Uh, Daniela, welcome. Uh, yes, a key point, many people have been talking about this global treaty on plastics. We know Ecuador is a champion. So what are you bringing us? Where, what, what's the content? Where are we 
doing with this uh, new multilateral treaty within the UN framework. Thank you, David. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Caroline and Mahesh, for organizing this, this event, for inviting Ecuador to this very important roundtable. Uh, congratulations to, for the very timely and excellent report. I would also like to recognize the work of the different organizations and institutions that are here with us today. And of course, uh, congratulations, uh, Damaris and David, for the excellent conduction of this meeting. Um, I want to start by stating that preventing and reducing plastic pollution require national action, but also regional and multilateral cooperation and coordination. Caroline mentioned that in a in an excellent way. It also requires to acknowledge the synergies between trade and environmental issues and the potential of the circular economy. And even if current governance approaches are insufficient from the, for the moment and fragmented, there is quite a work that has been done on how to address plastics pollution and transition to a more sustainable economy. Technologies there, more and more countries implement domestic action plans and mechanisms with multi-stakeholder approaches where public and private alliances are instrumental. Uh, I'm not an expert on this topic as Caroline and Mahesh uh, and Eric, I see you are here as well, uh, are and all of you. Uh, but as, I'm, as a diplomat, I can tell you many governments are taking this task very seriously. And I will mention uh, two initiatives. Uh, one uh, already mentioned by David, thank you. Uh, Ecuador is participating, uh, is part of uh, the multilateral arena uh, at the UN and at the WTO. Uh, well, just to mention, just to give some news, Germany, Ecuador, Ghana, and Vietnam are organizing a ministerial conference to discuss uh, the legally binding agreement on marine plastic pollution. This will occur here in Geneva, uh, the first week of September and it would have been impossible to carry out this process without UNEP and the support of Norway in its capacity as chair of the United Nations Environmental Assembly. The objective of this ministerial meeting is to gain broad political support for a legally binding instrument or marine plastic pollution. So that is a decision on a specific mandate to start negotiations on this instrument can be adopted in the fifth session of the UNEA UN Environmental Assembly on February next year. This would, this would give us the opportunity for global governance to address, for a gov to have a global governance to address marine plastic pollution, which has an environmental impact for sure, but also it negatively affects economic sustainability by preventing us from taking full advantage of the blue economy's potential, which depends ultimately on the integrity of our ecosystems. And this is very important for development. Ecuador has a, a strong position on this issue uh, because we believe it is uh, one of the most urgent environmental problems we're all facing nowadays. And actually it has become worse in the recent years. Uh, actually since Rio plus 20, uh, since the conference of Rio plus 20 in 2000, 2012, Ecuador negotiated the chapter for oceans and seas on behalf of all developing countries. Um, by then we achieved inclusion of a specific reference to um, the war, about the worrying situation of marine plastic pollution and its impact of marine, on marine ecosystems, as well as the need for urgent international actions for their protection in a final document of the conference uh, that was called the future we want. Uh, also, uh, we were, we had a firm position during the negotiation of the SDGs uh, that were mentioned as well at the end of the day, this is an issue about development. Uh, and uh, we work towards uh, including uh, how to prevent uh, the issue on how to prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution of all kinds, especially by plastics. Along the same lines, and I would like to, to talk about also the informal dialogue on plastics pollution and environmentally sustainable plastic trade, uh, which uh, Ecuador is part of. And actually we thank China and Fiji to start this conversation at the WTO and to bring this issue to the Multilateral Trade Forum. Uh, because it has started a very timely and essential conversation. Uh, and now it has the support of countries from all regions. Actually, I like to say that we are the most diverse group in the WTO because 
uh, we have really countries for every region in the world and well multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams and, uh, and diverse teams, uh, we can come with innovative and sustainable solutions, we hope. So answering one of the questions on how and where international corporations on trade policy best contributes to efforts to reduce plastic pollution, uh, we believe as Ecuador, we do need to work in various fronts throughout a comprehensive and intersectorial treatment of plastics throughout the entire life cycle. And just back to my first point, national action is important, but not enough. Uh, so we believe by working in these two fronts, the UN and the WTO, we can garner consensus uh, in different areas uh, that pertain to a, a, new, a comprehensive framework on how to better address this problem uh, and how we can take full advantage of circular economy. I will just mention uh, some of the areas our informal dialogue is working, um, is debating about. And actually, Jovan already mentioned a lot of them improving transparency, monitoring uh, trade trends, promoting best practices. Uh, but also, on the other hand, uh, addressing um, policy coherence, and there's a lot of things we can do in terms uh, of the work that the Committee on Trade Obstacles to Trade um, eh, is uh, debating about uh, or is discussing about at the WTO, eh, and identifying the scope for collective approaches. Um, we, uh, in this area, uh, we are looking to enhance cooperation with regional groupings and efforts eh, that have not being yet fully explored. Uh, for example, just uh, Ecuador just knew from the Latin American Integration Association, all the work they are doing to identify and promote uh, innovative industries. Uh, now coming to the area of capacity building and technical assistance, uh, we believe it is vital to map existing capacity and technical assistance. Uh, first, uh, on, the topic, on this topic in the, what's been done in the different multilateral environmental agreements, but also at the region and, and at the bilateral level. And, Thank uh, you, uh, Maria Daniela. Could you sum up what's the last message? Because we have other speakers. We, we love what you're saying, especially on capacity building. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so excited always with the IDP. But uh, yes, just to, I will just... Uh, and uh, finish by saying that we're having a meeting uh, on Monday. We're addressing uh, the issue about um, technical uh, capacity and um, technical assistance and capacity building. And uh, one of our key speakers are going to uh, talk about uh, marine plastic pollution. And uh, we believe uh, actually coordinated efforts uh, between our organization and our instrumental. Thank you very much, David, and thank you, Damaris. Sorry to take too, too much time. This is a very- No, 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 no. We, when we have wisdom, it's good to listen. And, <laughs> and, and always, uh, we have a mandate with this SDG 141. So we just need to uh, develop the mandate for a treaty making in the UN. Now from the Ecuador, we're going to the Arctic. So we have Eric Lidenberg from the Global Plastic uh, uh, policy manager of .wf. So please, uh, Eric, show us the way to the north. <laughs> I will. I will do my best. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, and uh, thank you for the invitation to come here. It has been really valuable to uh, hear the uh, presentation and uh, interventions uh, uh, following. I think that uh, I want to. Uh, join the list of appreciators of the, the new report. It provides really a good menu, I think, to uh, uh, start uh, choosing from of um, which kind of uh, policy measures that we should engage on, on when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to plastic uh, pollution and trade. Um, as uh, was mentioned, uh, um, by uh, several previous speakers, I think we are uh, in a situation where uh, we're facing this rapidly growing, accelerating environmental, global environmental problem. And um, currently we don't have the regulatory frameworks in place to solve it. So we are uh, as a global community um, in a rush to tackle this problem and to get those frameworks up and running. Uh, luckily, there is this important momentum. Uh, 
as was mentioned, a uh, hundred governments have already committed to start negotiations on a new uh, international treaty on plastic pollution. And as Daniela just mentioned, uh, Ecuador, uh, together with uh, Germany, Ghana and Vietnam, is hosting a global ministerial conference in September uh, in Geneva and, and with virtual participation possible also, I think. Um, that will be an important milestone towards that uh, decision of uh, starting negotiations. We in WWF believe that such a treaty is an essential uh, piece of the puzzle and where uh, and, and one that can uh, contribute to closing a large part of that big global gap that we're seeing. But then, of course, it, it wouldn't close all of them but it would create a, a, a common direction and a common form for, um, uh, for solving this going forward. Then other uh, existing conventions have been mentioned, uh, great progress, of course, under the Basel Convention, uh, Stockholm Convention, also uh, important and discussions going on under WTO. But what I would really urge for is to have uh, synergies between these processes. I think that the trade community, uh, particularly in Geneva, but uh, uh, also more broadly, have a lot to contribute to into the development of a new global instrument. So uh, I would say that in, instead of uh, creating separate and com competing to some extent initiatives, I think uh, we should all join forces and make sure that we use the best uh, available knowledge in these efforts. Uh, the decision on a negotiation mandate for the treaty will hopefully come at uh, UNEA 5 in February next year, but I think that the discussions following that and also leading up to that should be uh, much broader than also just limited uh, to UNEA, just because we need that knowledge uh, that sits in trade community in Geneva, public health community for that sake, um, and, uh, and in, in business community and among civil society and in, in other UN forums as well. So I'm, I'm on the one side um, extremely worried of the situation when you look at the development uh, the, the, of the problem and the accelerating pace really of plastic pollution that we're experiencing at the moment. But then uh, what really gives me hope is the big uh, public demand. We see citizens engaging uh, uh, more than ever and really putting pressure on both companies and governments in a, in a almost unprecedented way. Um, and then that now combined with initiatives among governments to also tackle this uh, at the global level through a treaty. Governments uh, leading the way in this direction and uh, uh, I encourage everyone to attend that ministerial conference uh, in September. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. A excellent point. Seems that we will have a very busy next semester, you know, Ministerial Conference on Plastics, OMTAC 15 Conference, and WTO Ministerial Conference. So we have a lot of plastic and fish work to do. Uh, I think a key point of Eric is that the role of the public demand and civil society is essential in this particular issue, has been the engine and cannot be denied. So we welcome all the support and all the action by all civil society organizations. Now I'm going to give the floor to Diana, my colleague Diana. She's, she's the mother of the database in OMTAC, uh, preparing this data that was presented by Carolina Mahesh on uh, uh, export values along, along the value chain. So Diana is going to explain us how OMTAC can help in this entire process and based on the recommendations already well proposed by this report. Diana, welcome. Thank you, David. Um, let's say Godmother. There are many, there are many people working on this. Oh, no, no, mother is better. Right? <laughs> um, so David has, so I'm allowed four minutes. So I want to try and say three things uh, quickly. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the need for information and transparency. And in fact, 
this was what we aimed to do with this um, UNCTAD database, which we're really delighted that it's being put to such good use in, in this paper today. Carolyn and Mahesh, congratulations on that. Um, this is exactly what we wanted to achieve during the kind of long and indeed somewhat painful process of putting together this database. Uh, it came from this recognition that the first step to try and tackle the problem of plastics pollution is to try and understand it better and to understand some of the forces that are behind it. And it's not until we have data about, uh, you know, what is driving the industry of the uh, plastic economy, not until we have that data that we can really try and set ambitions and, and, and targets. So as they have noted, the speakers today have noted the UNCTAD plastic database, it's the first time ever that um, we have tried to quantify and map global trade flows across the entire life cycle of plastic. So this is really very important that we start at the very beginning from the raw inputs and we go to the final products and then eventually to waste. And um, we felt this was so important. In fact, UNCTAD will make this database freely available to everybody, to all researchers. It will be on our website. And uh, we hope this will make a very positive contribution to the debate because until now it's actually been quite difficult to get this, this information completely. And I should maybe say that putting together this database, it involved scientists as well as industry experts in addition to statisticians. Um, why was it so complicated? Well, one issue is that we needed to go into really granular examination of the HS codes because the HS code that relates specifically to plastic, uh, in fact, it leaves a lot out. There's a lot that's not counted. And uh, we went to big efforts to try and uh, quantify what's called semi-hidden plastics trade. And uh, work is, you know, this job is never finished. Work is going on now with other colleagues who are inspired to try and quantify the really the hidden trade. Um, but what's, you know, let's think about what we found with this plastic database. As I said, we're trying to get um, information and transparency. And maybe the most important finding for today uh, and for you know, ongoing efforts to, uh, to try and reduce plastic pollution is that trade is absolutely central to plastic. I think maybe we didn't uh, realize this to quite the same extent before we had this information from the database, because in fact, the, the, um, the sort of less, less uh, perfect ways of trying to measure it uh, underestimated trade flows in plastic by as much as 40% in price and 25% in volume. And we still think these are underestimates. So that's the importance of getting data. The other thing we found, which is really important, is that there's almost not a single country in the world that's untouched in the trade in plastics. And this should not really surprise us because plastics is very useful. You know, we have benefited greatly from the use of plastic in some ways, but you know, unfortunately it has this other side, which is causing many problems. But the point that no country is untouched help, helps us understand more that the industry, it's very complex and nuanced. And now I want to think about the role of developing countries in plastics. As Caroline pointed out, there are big uh, players, big users of plastic, deeply involved in the plastic economy, um, which is unsurprising given how useful and cheap it is and how it's unimaginable uh, many of the things in our daily life without it. I think it's important to note that for many developing countries, plastics has been a path to development. And even countries that want to reduce the excessive use on it uh, are still depending on it. So that leads me to the second point that I want to make, which is that uh, the developmental angle on this whole story, this is something that's going to be very important to us. Trade policy can be an important lever to try and reduce plastics pollution, but it's going to have to be sensitive to the needs and capacities of different countries and their stages of development. And we're going to need more research on what policies countries can use to try and diversify into plastics alternatives, for example, or to improve, improve processes of production so that they are less excessive in the use of plastic. What is gonna work for transformation so that developing countries are not disadvantaged in this much needed move to reduce pl plastics pollution, but we have to accept that these will not be sustainable if countries are not treated according to uh, their needs with the technology and the support. So let's leave my third uh, point that I wanted to make, which is the way that UNCTAD is um, contributing to the plastics debate. And uh, we are aiming to do this in a very kind of cooperative and comprehensive approach. So UNCTAD is the focal point for the United Nations on trade and investment and finance, also technology and 
uh, logistics and development. So we have, you know, we're a broad house and we have many different uh, sources of expertise. So one of the issues that uh, we have been working on with plastics here in back very closely with well, David is leading this, the um, UNCLEAD work on plastics, pollution and oceans. And this is part of work that's been described as the need for a blue new deal. Also the substitutes to plastics, you know, moving into new sunrise industries for developing countries and not being stuck with sunk assets and sunset industries. You know, how, how do we do this? What are the processes to do this? And also sustainable manufacturing. So the processes and the products that can have less negative spillovers and less, extra, less externalities. Now, this is a, for my side, I work for the Globalization and Development Strategies Grants. This is a very concrete application of what we're calling the Green New Deal, the need for a Green New Deal. In David's section, he's, he's looking at it from oceans and blue. It's frozen. Uh, oh. This can be an opportunity, a big opportunity without underestimating the challenges, of course. I mean, without underestimating that, change is coming. And so we want the transition to be just. If it's not just, it won't be sustainable. So we want a transition that is just, but we also want a transition that leads to a transformation that supports the SDGs and supports a greener planet. And no country can do this alone. So I think Talking it's very- the transition, Diana, I have to- <laughs> I'm planet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have to go into the transition for the next. I was finishing anyway. <laughs> okay, okay. <gasps> okay, I'm finished. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry. Now, in going into transition from cooperation from one UN agency to another, now we're going from Geneva to Nairobi. And we have Leticia Carvalho. Leticia, could you please uh, enlighten us on there are many proposals on this global tritium plastics, we call it a uh, tritium on marine plastics and uh, marine debris. Uh, 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 and also, what uh, is the process leading to the next uh, UN Environment uh, uh, Assembly? And also, a very important point that people tend to forget, what's the link of this process with current negotiations in New York on a treaty on biodiversity in its international jurisdiction? Because we're having now multiple multilateral processes dealing with pollution. Welcome, Leticia. Thank you very much, David. I hope you can hear uh, and see me well. So it's really an exciting debate. Thanks a lot for this invitation and congratulations, Caroline and Mahesh for the excellent uh, report, a great collaboration to the world debate on uh, marine litter, plastic pollution and, uh, and, the, and the systemic uh, plastic issue. So let me just recall a little bit that um, UNAP is a pioneer agency uh, with more than 10 years working on this topic. It's actually a very, uh, one of the, actually a single, a unique mandated UN agency uh, in order to look into the land sources of pollution that are actually affecting our oceans. And in doing so, I think uh, UNAP uh, has been helping to uh, unfold so many different aspects of the dis of these discussions. And finally, now we, we have the global and inter international community uh, actually starting or about to take important decisions, uh, concrete decisions to sort it out this very complex problem. Um, so with that, I very much welcome uh, other UN uh, sister agencies as UNCTAD, WTO, and all the international community of experts that are now uh, actually bringing even more lights on the many uh, uh, specific aspects of this uh, problem. Yes, we are all aware uh, that the importance of the global plastics economy, uh, as Caroline, Caroline already mentioned, plastic have made plastics actually have made easier our life much easier. Shipping contains lighter, and this is uh, really something transformational for the trade, and given us long lasting and affordable products that have transformed the, uh, the efficiency uh, of our lives and the trade itself. However, we have become so accustomed to low cost convenience from purchase ease uh, to out of sight, out of mind disposal. Then in the last 50 years, uh, we have developed a throwaway culture that has not accounted for the lifespan of eventual fate of single use, unnecessary and avoidable plastics. So here we are, all of us 
facing this crisis and the consequences and trying to join hands to find an effective solution that has to come very quick. Uh, as we talk stake, uh, as we, we talk stake of the state of our planet, I, I definitely need to go again and what my secretary, what the UN Secretary General already said about the triple planetary crisis of biodiversity breakdown, climate instability and rampant pollution are clipping our planet's ability to deliver its invaluable services to humanity. And this is definitely related also uh, to the plastics scourge cross cuts, all of these existing, 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 existing issues, apologies. Uh, plastic definitely represented the largest, most harmful, and I think this was said, but it's necessary to repeat, uh, most persistent fraction of marine litter. And I will just address the topic and the, as you requested me, David, on the, on the concept between marine litter, marine plastic and plastic pollution. And it's definitely accountable or actually accounting for at least 85% of the total of marine waste. So again, we have our oceans absolutely connected with what's going on on Earth, on land and with the world. And actually uh, the marine litter is the most visible or the first visible portion of this problem that with time and investment and science and advocacy. Now we have uh, the international community looking in with a much more detailed and complex perspective. This means from the downstream uh, and the end of pipe problem, that is the litter going, the marine litter and litter going to the, into the oceans and then in the upstream where all the problem is being generated. So it's important to flag that the annual flow of plastic into ocean will near, nearly triple by 2040 to 29 million metric tons per year. And this is equivalent to 50 kilograms for every metre of coastline in the world. And also we have at the moment 90% of the seabirds with uh, plastics in their guts and the stomachs. And then again, I think uh, it was mentioned, microplastics are being found in everywhere. We have from the Arctic uh, and all oceans is definitely now a pervasive uh, uh, problem. And this is definitely for us now a wake up call uh, for action. And trade is of course, absolutely central uh, to the global plastics economy. The production and consumption of plastics involve actors in all the value chain from upstream to downstream and across the globe. Uh, I mentioned quickly that UNEP work is addressing uh, marine litter and plastic pollution as we were mandated uh, by UNEA resolutions uh, when uh, precisely 2014, uh, the global debate actually converges for a more concrete, concrete action uh, that is now taking place in many different areas of the world, in many different of the world, in many different agencies as well as we are seeing, but has some uh, of the foundational elements uh, in EUNEA 2014, with the, uh, some resolutions since then that are actually uh, reiterating or enlarging the mandate of the of the UNEP uh, uh, and the international community in order to. Uh, discuss and find policy solutions for this issue. In particular, I would like to mention that uh, UNEA Resolution 3 slash 7 and 4 slash 6 is actually de developing a vision that we should address marine litter and plastic pollution and microplastic. And uh, this is our long term vision we are pursuing uh, in the mandates uh, that we also envisage UNEA will soon be able to take. Uh, and in this regard, I need to mention that uh, UNEA 4 also issued a very important resolution that is enlarging what I said is started as a marine litter uh, most uh, or clearest portion of the problem that is actually the UNEA resolution 4 slash 9 addressing single use plastic products that encompass the notion and the aspect that the whole life cycle of impacts of the plastic products and their alternatives should be part of the uh, of a mandate and of the action of the global action. So in this regard, uh, let me just translate that last year when the ad hoc expert working group that was actually the process put in place by UNEA uh, to bring the international community to the center of this discussion or to join, join hands uh, really to leverage these discussions and uh, find the range of options that, uh, that, that eventually could be taken by the international community. Uh, in this regard, uh, since 2020, it's absolutely clear and captured in the chair summary of the AHAG, uh, the expert group, that the life cycle and the sustainable consumption and production aspect and, um, and the upstream uh, measures should be part 
of the solution and of the future decision making uh, eventually at uh, in, in UNEA 5.2 as we are all looking for the 2022. So just to flag- Can you sum up, Leticia, because we, we, have, we have time limits. Can you sum up? Yes, sorry. Uh, just to conclude and sorry for the excitement, but just to say that UNEP is absolutely keen to uh, look for uh, this momentum that is growing and seeing that UNEA 5.2 uh, February next year is definitely the moment for the international community to take, to take a very effective decision for this topic. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. I understand we're all getting excited. This is more interesting than the Biden's uh, Putin summit yesterday. I'm sorry, this is fascinating. So now I'm going to a uh, world lead expert on subsidies uh, uh, and trade policy. We have Alice Tipping, she will explain us her point of view on the different options on their trade law, but also on what could be done to address the systemic problem of fuel subsidies within the value chain of plastics. Alice, bienvenida. Thank you very much, David, um, and congratulations to Carolyn and to Mahesh on this really comprehensive effort. We are delighted to have been involved in shaping, at least to a small degree, the trade policy options in the report. I'm, an, I'm going to focus sort of back on the, the title of the, of the report itself and this question of how international cooperation on trade policies can best contribute to efforts to reduce plastic pollution. And in fact, the answer to the question is set out in a really neat diagram in the report, uh, which I encourage you to read. What I'm going to do here, just to sort of bring us back to this question of what can be done on trade policy, is to summarise and maybe just highlight for everyone what I thought the top line issues were, where trade policy could have the most direct impact on the, on the plastics question. So essentially, and this is in the diagram, the cooperative use of trade policies can contribute to four basic policy objectives here. And these can be, can, these can be pursued across different timescales, short, medium, or long-term. So starting with the short-term things, and many of these have been, have been raised sort of in passing so far. So first, trade policy can be used to restrict trade in problematic plastics and waste in order to shrink the market for these materials and thus reduce the scope and scale of the environmental harm they can cause. So governments can do this unilaterally, of course. Um, they can impose unilateral trade bans on problematic plastics or plastic waste, but experience has shown that unilateral bans can lead just to waste being diverted to nearby markets which makes sense when you think about it. Once a container has been sent halfway across the world, a shipper is not likely to want to take it all the way home again. They're more likely to want to try and find another port close by that will accept it. So a coordinated regional restriction on imports of problematic plastics or waste would seem a good option to explore. So first option, restricting trade in problematic plastics and waste. Second, trade policy can be used to encourage trade in plastic substitutes and recycled plastic. People have talked about this already. And that's essentially growing the market for alternatives to virgin plastics. So measures to replace or recycle plastic packaging, which was such a huge part of the problem as we heard first, that could fit in there, the second part of growing the market for alternatives. Thirdly, trade policy can help to increase access to goods and services needed to improve management of plastics that are currently in the system, that are, whose, whose life cycle we're currently in the middle of. So that's everything from recycling to ensuring border agencies have access to the equipment they need to test imports of plastic, for example, to be sure of its composition, as well as access to the services they need to install and maintain that equipment. So goods and services will often go together. Again, the trade policy could be used unilaterally to do all of these things, but countries might find it beneficial to think about removing access to regional, removing barriers to trade in the context of regional or multilateral cooperative arrangements, essentially so that they can trade off access to their markets for some of these goods and products for access to other countries' markets. So there's a cooperative opportunity there in addition to what governments can already do unilaterally. Um, so all of that brings me to the last, possibly the most challenging and therefore likely the longer term contribution trade policy can make, and Carolyn's referred to this at the beginning. So if we think about it, reducing the market for harmful plastics, trying to grow the market for alternatives to virgin plastic, and trying to better manage the volume of plastic already on the market, is all dealing with the end of the pipe. 
right? To be really effective, a policy response to the plastics challenge is going to have to address the reasons why so much plastic is being produced in the first place, and that includes subsidies provided along the value chain for the production of fossil fuels that are used to make virgin plastics to the production of plastic products themselves. Now, IISD's own fossil fuel subsidy tracker shows that in 2019, governments spent $64 billion supporting just the production of fossil fuels. This is a trade policy question, because these subsidies, we think, must shape global trade in plastic products, and because the WTO system of treaties currently includes the only multilaterally agreed set of rules on subsidies. Um, thinking about all of these questions, I'm going to go back and actually quote verbatim, if I can, Diana, because all of these questions on trade policy will benefit from greater monitoring, will benefit from greater data. All of these questions of trade policy are going to need to be addressed and discussed in the context of government's own priorities and in particular their development priorities. So all of this, and I quote Diana, must, all of this discussion must be sensitive to developing countries' needs and their stages of development, unquote, because I couldn't have said it better myself. The four contributions of trade policy, you'll find them neatly summarized at the top of the graph uh, in Carolyn Mahesh's excellent paper. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, also, congratulations for keeping the time, for the, the best uh, timing so far. Now we're also uh, moving to, to a different angle. We're going to look at, at, at uh, how we're uh, gonna implement the Basel amendments on, on hazardous plastic waste. And, and which options there are in place to, uh, to link these to, to the crisis of plastic. We have Eleonore uh, Dasinsu, uh, staff attorney at Ciel. Uh, welcome, Eleonore, it's a real pleasure to have you on. Thank you, David, for the introduction and Caroline for your kind invitation. And congratulations for the launch of this report. I hope it will be successful in supporting later reforms and needed conversations, as well as urgent actions around the issue of plastic and trade. Um, as highlighted by this report, maintaining the status quo regarding plastic is not an option. And this is due to the failure of the current fragmented and uncoordinated regime to combat the issue. On this point, I would like to reinforce the fact that the Basel Convention on the Control of Transboundary Movements of hazardous waste and their disposal includes since January plastic amendments, but lacks a strong compliance mechanism and robust coordination with trade policies and treaties. First, there is a general lack of effective control on site of plastic waste, which is highlighted somehow by this report. Second, coordination between the Basel Convention and the Harmonized System Code is needed. As an example, some states consider that under the Harmonized System Code 3915, there are no restrictions or limitations to the import of plastic, which are actually covered by the Basel Convention. So further discussions about this and coordination between those, those two mechanisms are essential. Third, and more generally, Article 11 of the Basel Convention provides that a member state that only enters into a bilateral agreement with another state regarding the transboundary movement of hazardous waste, provided that such agreement upholds the same standards or higher standards than those found in the Basel Convention. Those bilateral agreements uh, could indirectly be, for example, FTAs or LTAs, and it is essential then to ensure that the latest comply with Article 11, which happens often not to be the case. And finally, the Basel Convention only addresses the transboundary movement of some plastics, but it does not address plastic in its full life cycle. So in this point, as you may know, uh, because of the urgency of the situation, and this has been discussed by many people um, in, in this conversation today, there is a sprint happening at the international level to form an international legally binding agreement on plastic. I hope actually that this report will be used to highlight the issue of plastic and trade in full and foster the much needed conversations and concrete actions around trade and plastic alongside the negotiations of this specific treaty as this report provides deeper clarity regarding plastic in, tra in trade trends, flows, dynamics, and policies. Thank you very much for your attention. I try to keep it very short um, so we can maintain the, the time. Thank you. Beautiful, Eleonora, another good student with very strict time compliance. You were talking about compliance. Now uh, we're going to move to, to Kimberly Bombright. Uh, trade investment lead uh, at the World Economic Forum. Thank you for being here. It's, uh, uh, it would be good if you could enlighten us on what can the private sector do 
uh, uh, challenges in implementing Basel. And do we have markets for recycling if we're going to reduce uh, plastic output? What ideas can we have from the private sector? Thank you very much, Kimberly. It's always a pleasure to have you. Thanks so much. And I will try and be like a, a carbon sink, but a time sink and, and give you all a bit of time back. Um, I don't know how much I can answer that particular question in, in one to two minutes, but I can say that uh, we do have a paper coming out where we've been doing similarly studying what trade policy can do and, and addressing some of those questions, but rather very much from the national level. So what we've been doing is focusing on Ghana, where our team, my environment team within the World Economic Forum is doing some work on addressing plastic pollution, really focusing on it from the environmental perspective. And we've come through with some, some uh, uh, commissioned experts who, who authored this report to layer on the trade policy angle. Our problem statement is really, do trade flows and policies help or hinder plastic pollution action within Ghana um, and what can be done? And it picks up on many of the themes that you've been highlighting here all today. I could not agree more with the points that have been made, my, made uh, by Diana and Alice on data. Um, and so the additional work that, that's coming through here is really helpful and we need to keep pushing on that front. It makes it very difficult for us to understand how to advise a country when we simply do not know what the scale of the challenges and where the flows are. Um, then I will also uh, like to again pick on what, what Diana said about economic opportunity. When we think about this from a development perspective, we have to take into account the industrialization and the just transition angle. Otherwise, this agenda just won't pick up, it won't take hold at the grassroots level. Um, so, Ghana, like many other developing countries, is facing this challenge because plastics is a really key part of many of the ways they're looking to tackle so social challenges like safe drinking water, etc. So thinking about industrial transformation and I think scaling also the understanding of how plastic is used in those and what does it mean by sustainable uh, industrial transformation, um, what are some of the circular economy policies that need to be put in place and also models and really getting granular and detailed in that is the homework that trade policy um, makers need to do before we start to write rules and, and, and regulations around that or maybe perhaps in parallel I think there has to be a joint learning process here um, but I would also uh, want to echo what Yvonne said at the beginning and perhaps correct myself in, in, in when I said before starting to write rules we don't have a lot of time to, to help the planet and to make these um, big shifts in industry that need to happen. We have about a decade and we're already a year into that really, this really transformational decade. So I will leave um, you all with that in mind and thank you all for, for the great insights. It was a pleasure to listen. And thank you to Carolina Mahesh for the world of presentation. Thank you to all the commentators. I think it has been a very rich discussion, very fruitful. I think some, just some quick conclusions of today. I think, look, I think we all agree that trade has a fundamental role in addressing the plastic crisis. Uh, the plastic crisis. Second, I think uh, uh, we have a menu of trade policies that could be undertaken, whether at the multilateral or national level. We have a network. We have a group of actors present today that can enable change. Uh, we have also a timeline. We have three major event this semester and two major events next year. Again, ONTAC 15, the Ministerial Conference for a Plastic Treaty. We have WTMC 12. We have UN Environment, uh, uh, the UNEP Environmental Assembly, and we have the second Oceans Conference in June next year. So we have a lot of milestones to advance this agenda. So having said that, and knowing that uh, we have a quite long list of actions to be taken, I leave the word now to Damaris for concluding this wonderful webinar. Thank you so much, um, uh, David, and really uh, a warm thank you to all speakers uh, and participants for the discussion, uh, the questions and, and the insights. I think as you mentioned, uh, David, we heard loud and clear that trade policy and international cooperation on trade uh, are a key piece uh, of the puzzle and uh, uh, we'll need to uh, enhance synergies. I think we also heard uh, clearly that despite many initiatives at the national, regional and international level, uh, we still have some gaps and there's lots of room for improvement in terms of data, transparency, coherence and, and cooperation. And I think it's clear to, uh, to all of us that we need to uh, do much more if we are to tackle this uh, global crisis. 
I think today's event is a perfect example of how important it is to bring different stakeholders around the, the table. Let's hope it will not only be virtual table, but uh, uh, that we can also soon meet in, in person. Uh, because with them, uh, you all brought uh, your different uh, uh, perspectives. And I think if we are to tackle this global challenge, we also need to work uh, with all of you. So a big thank you to all personally, but also to the international um, uh, organizations. And I have to say that uh, I was glad to hear, you know, a number of expression like uh, joining force. I'm quite, uh, I leave this event more hopeful. I think with such competence and drive, uh, uh, we have a chance to tackle this, uh, this challenge. I was already very happy to see that uh, Carolyn said it's only um, uh, it's not a one off event. You know, I, I think we're now even more excited to to read the report that will launch next week. Please subscribe to Test Forum to get it uh, uh, as soon as, as possible. You can also follow it on uh, on Twitter. But I'm glad that she said that it's a first event that many more conversation in different formats will also follow. And uh, you can count on, on Switzerland in the different uh, forum, but of course, uh, uh, also at the WTO to try to make all this great recommendation uh, a reality. So a big thank you to, to all. Uh, very much looking forward to reading the report and have a nice uh, day, afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much.